case you're wondering what room you're in, uh, you're in the room where we're going to talk about the Bay Area Mesh. Uh, and I'm Greg Albrecht, W2GMD. Uh, thanks for coming. Uh, so I'm going to try to juggle two things in my hand, so I apologize for that ahead of time. Uh, so let me start off by saying uh, Bay Area Mesh. You might not have heard of the Bay Area Mesh. You might know us under a different name, uh, the San Francisco Wireless Emergency Mesh. Um, we've decided to change the, the name of the project to Bay Area Mesh to better match what we're actually doing. Um, I would say, you know, hindsight is 2020. Very early on, I realized we probably shouldn't have called the project San Francisco uh, Mesh because it extends beyond San Francisco, A, right? And B, really any utility of what we're doing is going to extend beyond San Francisco alone. Um, you know, North California generally is a mutual aid state, and everything we do in every county and every municipality benefits not just us, but our neighbors. So that's why we've decided to rename the project the Bay Area Mesh, or BAM, yeah. for short. <laughs> so I wanted to start with a story, uh, sort of what inspired, oh, you know what I can do? I can put the microphone right here. I can put the thing right here. Uh, what inspired us to do this? So I live in San Francisco, in the sunset, right near the ocean, and... I was going to bed one night, and I made the mistake of looking at my phone one more time. And someone said, they're evacuating Napa. Um, it was on Instagram or Twitter or something, right? They said, they're evacuating Napa. And I'm like, that's a profound statement. That, to me, that's like, they're evacuating Brisbane. They're evacuating Daly City. I'm like, that's, that's, that's a lot to evacuate. So I, I think, you know, I got up to go to the bathroom one more time or something, and I, I looked at my phone again, again, second mistake. And someone said, it smells like smoke. I'm in the mission in San Francisco, downtown. It smells like smoke. I'm like, what? And then I sniff and I'm like, is there a campfire in my backyard? Like it, it was like, it was intense. And I've lived in San Francisco for 22 years. I've never experienced that before. And I don't mean to take a myopic view to this, but like it was new, it was new to me. And I woke up the next morning and I turned on uh, the radio, KQED, and they had sent a reporter up to Napa to see what the, what the heck was going on. And the reporter went to a hospital, and they interviewed someone at the hospital, and they said, Sir, ma'am, uh, where are you at the hospital? Are you injured? And the person said, Oh, no. I was at home. I heard something was going on. So I went to go on Facebook to find out what was happening. I couldn't get online, so I went to the hospital. And I'm like, wow, there's a lot to unpack from that statement. Whether or not you like Facebook, right, their instinct wasn't to phone a friend. It wasn't to turn on the AM, FM radio. It wasn't even to turn on the TV. They went online to find out what was happening. And then they went to the hospital, presumably either because the hospital would know what was happening or because they were treating the hospital like a Starbucks. They, you know, they would have Wi-Fi, right? <laughs> <laughs> but I, I reflected on as an e-comms person, a disaster communications person, what do we do when uh, we're under duress, right? What is our psychomotor action? How do we respond to these things? Typically, we turn on a radio, two-way radio, we get on a repeater, we might make some calls, but there's a gap, right? We're so far behind where everyone else is when they want to get information. They want to go online, they want to use the internet to get information, right? Whether or not it's a good source of news or fake news, right? It had a throughput and a bandwidth that gave them the information they needed in real time, and it, it was familiar, comfortable, and easy to use. And I thought, why aren't we doing that with emergency communications? Why aren't we stepping up to this higher bandwidth, higher throughput, higher capacity um, tool that we have? And I looked at the landscape of things that were available, and, and Arden fit the bill. Arden gave us a capability that we don't normally have as hands. So while we may lead with voice, voice may be the tip of the spear, we should follow with uh, additional capabilities, like a wireless mesh. Oh yeah, you're right, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, so what am I talking about? Like what, what is the application? What is the use case, right? Now, now is the use case, right? Um, everyone in this room has probably experienced one of these one of these in particular, right? All of these present their own communications challenges. And so I said, well, living in the impo uh, impothrophine, um, 
Let's build a mesh network. That might solve some of these problems. So what does a mesh network look like? How am I going to try to, to survive the now? Right? And a mesh network is a network topology that doesn't really have any centralization. Right? We're talking about nodes connected to other nodes, end users connected to nodes. Maybe there's high sites somewhere. But really the power of this isn't that there's a network. It's that there's individual nodes that can connect to each other, regardless of the technology. Right? It's a black box. But this is going to allow us to have that capability no matter where we're at. This is an, you know, uh, an example of a topology for a network. You know, you've got edge devices, you've got user devices, you've got nodes connected up. But this was my answer to how we're going to survive the now. I'm going to use my clicker now. Excellent. <laughs> Boom, there we go. OK. So BAM, Bay Area Mesh, is a project to install a resilient high-speed wireless network you know, connectivity throughout the Bay Area. What can you do with it? Right? If, it, if it has an IP, we can touch it. Right? Anything you can do on a regular network, we can do on BAM. Email, video chat, file sharing, sensors, the sky's the limit. Right? Maybe you know, uh, smart boba, I don't know. <laughs> um, but it's really universal. Right? It's just another network. But the capability is there. And I, I want to delve into that a little bit. BAM is a capability, and capability with a capital C. And I want to define that. The participants of the network have the skills, the tools, and the equipment to enable the capability. Right? The end users who are participating in the network aren't nameless faces. Right? They aren't just users. They're enablers of the network. You as a user setting this up at your house now have the knowledge of how to set up a node. That may not be useful for you at your house, but if you're deployed in an emergency and a node needs to get set up, hey, <laughs> you're not the person that knows how to set up a node, whether or not there's any existing infrastructure. Um, IP applications can be dropped into place. Right? There's not a lot of changes you need to make to use something like video sharing, video chat, file sharing, games on a network like this. It's relatively easy to integrate with new IP applications, right? Again, it's just an IP network. It's just a network. Um, anything you can imagine doing on a regular network, we can do on the BAM network. Um, another benefit is that it automatically configures and routes, right? There's not a lot of administrative overhead to enabling this network. Uh, it's, it's basically plug and play. And it, it gains its resiliency through auto configuration, auto discovery, and most importantly, diversity. And I wanted to focus on the diversity part. Not just in diversity of nodes, but diversity of environments and communities. Um, launching a, a long haul link over a neighborhood doesn't benefit the neighborhood. And in fact, it's at a detriment to the network because you're losing diversity. Right? If we look at having um, low sites, sites that are on houses or buildings, those sites add to the diversity and the multi-path nature of the network. And it's very important uh, to building out this network. BAM is also a force multiplier, and I'll, I'll define that as well. Its strength comes from its ability to deliver the capacity anywhere, or the capability anywhere, anytime. Right? We don't need an always-on steady state network. This can be a field-deployed network. You can use it for an individual event. You can scale it up to a large-scale event. You could do what we did, which is build a Bay Area-wide network. You know, it is kind of hard to talk with the mask on, so I'm going to take the mask yeah, off. Go for it. Sorry. Go for it. I find myself breathing hard here. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I get it. I get why people don't like it. Um, so you can bring this network up anywhere, right? You're not limited to the steady state network. You're not limited to any established network. You could pack this in a bag field deploy it, and you're up and running. And this is what we've done with a lot of medical events in the city. Um, any user with knowledge has the capability. Once you've set up a node, once you've trained someone how to set up a node, they know how to set up a node. Right? They can take that knowledge anywhere, to any agency, any organization, any incident, right? and deliver that capability. And that's what creates the force multiplier here, right? It's not just that you're adding a network. It's that you're a person that knows how to network. You've moved beyond limiting yourself, not limiting yourself, but 
what you've removed yourself from the constraints of voice and slow speed packet, and you now know how to do this. Um, just as a standalone repeater is useful, and this, this I, I, I'm pre-apologizing for the dig on Carla. Um, Carla and the wind system, those are, it's great that I can talk from here to San Diego on a repeater, but a local repeater is also useful. An unlinked repeater is also useful because it benefits the local community, right? So a standalone node, a standalone BAM node, is still benefiting the local community, even if it's not connected to the larger network. Right, think about all of the times you've read a resource list over the air and thought to yourself, oh man, if only I could send an email, right? Think of when you've done a, a windshield damage assessment, right? Why am I describing the building when I could just take a picture, right? Why say when you can show? And that's what we're really aiming for here. Um, so why today, like why, why is this even possible today? Well, it turns out there's a lot of spectrum available for us as hams. Um, a lot of it focuses around the ISM bands, 900, 2.4, 3 as it exists, and 5 gigahertz. We have a ton of spectrum in this space. Um, the hardware prices themselves have dropped precipitously, and we're using mostly off-the-shelf equipment, commercial off-the-shelf equipment. Uh, with the exception of supply chain shortages as they exist today, for the most part, the equipment we're using is readily available on the secondary market. The primary market is a little harder to get because of the supply chain issues, but for the most part, it's cheap. Um, the Arden firmware, which we depend upon, is pretty stable. It's been stable for a while now, and there's a really big corpus of devices that they support. You're not, you're not isolated to any particular vendor uh, when you're using that software. And the technical barriers to entry are relatively low. You don't need to be a, a well-versed <coughs> network administrator you know, a CCIE to do this, right? It's mostly plug and play. It should just work like your internet at home. You should just be able to plug into it, bring it up and be up and running. Um, and we have a beachhead of established nodes. We've done a lot of work in the last couple of years to set up high sites and hub nodes around the bay, which we're now trying to harden. Um, and we have definitive use cases. Um, and I'll describe a couple of the use cases later on. But um, anywhere you've ever needed internet connectivity, Arden can meet you there. BAM can meet you there. So when I say <laughs> prices have dropped, we've literally had wireless ISPs call us up and say, we're about to throw away all this equipment unless you get it. So you know, between me and, and Isaac and some of the other folks in the group, you know, we have filled my car up multiple times. We've filled up Isaac's truck multiple times because wireless ISPs are cycling out a lot of this equipment. Not because it's defunct, but because they're moving on to 802.11 AC equipment, right? Newer generation equipment. We've taken this, we scrub it, literally scrub this in my kitchen sink, um, and you know, reprovision it and just hand it out, right, to people. So I, I kind of feel like, let's go here. I'm just like, they're just giving it away. Um, how are we? How are we growing? How are we making the network bigger? Uh, well, us, all of us here, you and me, um, we have a volunteer-led outreach team. Uh, we've been doing a lot of training. Uh, I'm sorry if this font's a little too small. Oh, I should, I'll correct that for next time. Number five is too low. Oh, number five. At the very end. Oh, down there. Yeah, I'll get, I'll get to that. Um, uh, we have a volunteer-led outreach team. We've been doing a lot of uh, training, uh, seminars, webinars for folks. Um, a lot of outreach to ham clubs. Um, you know, we'll tra train the trainer type of stuff, or finding a an advocate or or a Gladwellian a maven within an organization. Uh, we have an installation A team. And this is our installation subject matter A team. We've got uh, Mathis in here. We've got Isaac. We've got me. We've got Daniel. These are folks that are willing to help you out in building building your node, or help agencies or organizations in building their sites. Right? They know what equipment you need. They know what band you should be on. They know what um, expendables you might need, or, or um, you know, cabling, wiring, connectors. Um, where you do a lot of coordination, and we have multiple coordination channels. We primarily use the uh, San Francisco Radio Club Slack. We also have a mailing list. Uh, we try to put stuff on our website. Um, but we do a lot of coordination online, so it's very helpful. Um, and we move fast and use things, and the, the subtext here is lots of zip ties and gaff tape. Um, the only way we've been able to grow the network is by using the network. Right. Any time you've ever done a public service event, marathon, bike-a-thon, the pride parade, the giants parade, big festival, roll this stuff out. Right. If you find yourself calling down to Third and Folsom every 15 minutes to find out what the marathon race looks like, how many people are there, 
you're wasting bandwidth, right? You were tying up a voice channel with routine traffic that could be answered by putting a, a video camera up and beaming that camera back over the mesh. And not only is that having you utilize the network, you're now creating a tight OTA loop, right? You're, this is your observe, orient, decide, act, right? The, the tighter you can make that loop, the more effective you can make the network. And that's what we're aiming for here. Use it, iterate. Use it, iterate. Get feedback. You don't need to wait for a definitive guide on how to build your mobile deployment before you go and test it. Just start testing it. That has the added benefit of showing the utility of the network and getting buy-in from agencies and organizations. And that's, that's been pretty critical to the build out of the network. And of course, the grant we received from ARDC, which I'd like to talk about a little bit. Uh, ARDC, Amateur Radio Digital Communications. Um, if you're not familiar with the background of ARDC, uh, there, was, there was an IP network called the AMPR network, AMPR. They had a big chunk of IP space in the 44 range. Turned out us hams weren't really using it all that much, so they cleaved off a piece of that and sold it to AWS uh, for some fund, some amount of money. And they've created this grant program where they're issuing grants to organizations that are building out infrastructure uh, and digital communications projects. And we were one of the grant uh, recipients. Um, our grant is going towards some of the pillars of amateur radio, uh, education, research, and mentorship uh, of the community on this network and the capabilities of this network. Um, building out field deployable assets uh, for the network, and then hardening the sites that we have, building reliable fault tolerant uh, sites out on the network. Uh, I talked about outreach. Um, everyone in the organization has had an opportunity to give presentations, and we always try to find a new person to give the presentation every time, with the exception of today, that's me giving the presentation. So this is us presenting to NERT, presenting to ORCA, uh, this was our first presentation about a year ago at the SF Radio Club. Um, I can guarantee that at least 43% of the people in this photo are still awake. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we have our Gorilla install team, our A team, going out doing installs. There's Matheson right there up on the tower. Uh, there's one of our first hub site installs. There's uh, Isaac's backside uh, laying down. This was our installation at the uh, San Francisco D uh, Fire Department Division of Training, Training Tower. Uh, this was actually our first off-the-grid site. So this site has no shore power. It's totally e-power uh, on the top of a, uh, how tall is the training tower? Five stories? Five-story training tower? A five-story walk-up training tower. If you can't see, there's a bunch of batter uh, batteries and cinder blocks back here. And us, uh, us out-of-shape hams had to schlep this up five flights of stairs. <laughs> Good times. Um, this is uh, down in Spring Valley. We added some fire spotting cameras for the volunteer fire department down there. And then this is Chris from Orca up on the tower. And then we also got some help from uh, some wireless ISPs um, adding equipment to some of their towers in the city. This is that, that SME, the Subject Matter Expert A team for installations. These are the people I defer to when we're talking about doing site installations. So you're not alone is the idea. Um, and we use it. Um, let me come back to this photo, but let me start here. This was one of our first deployments we did uh, for a DISCA exercise, Defense Support to Civil Authorities, at Fleet Week uh, two years ago, where we were doing a damage assessment and um, damage clearing, uh, debris clearing uh, exercise with the Navy. Uh, they needed to know what the equipment situation was at their staging area. So we very quickly deployed a camera out to the staging area where they had staged their equipment. So back at the, the talk, the operations center, we could see what equipment was available, what was staged, what crews were ready. Um, additionally, uh, future considerations were adding, um, and Rachel, shout out to, to you and your inspiration, um, cameras to the actual damage assessment vehicles so we could beam that data back in real time. Uh, we'll, we'll do that on a future iteration. Um, this, it's kind of a washed out picture, but my poor daughter is down here. She wanted to go with us on a site installation, and if you can tell in this picture, this was last year during fire season. This is all f wildfire smoke. She said, I want to come with you to the site install. And I'm like, well, it's going to be smoky. Turns out it was smoky and there was cow poop everywhere. So she got the added benefit of that. But you can make it a family affair. Uh, this is us at the San Francisco Marathon a couple years ago. Uh, you can see one of our portable nodes set up here. 
again, this was one of those situations where we, our radio operators were getting continuously asked, how many people, how many runners are at water station seven? I'm like, why are you tying up the radio? <laughs> just put a camera. So we beamed that camera back to the operations center and we could just sit, point at the screen and say, look, I'm particularly proud of this one. This is Kylie Davidson, one of the, the early founders of the project. Um, if you've ever been to a conference in San Francisco, this is Moscone Center, which became the COVID command center last year. So this was in March of 2020. You know, no one knew, no one knew, right? No one knew what we were getting into. Um, we didn't know what kind of disaster this would be, right? We've trained for a lot of different types of disasters. So we dragged everything out, right? We dragged out the mesh, we dragged out a packet station. Um, we were given the keys to the house at Moscone and we, we did a site survey and we had it lit up within a couple of hours. We had um, video feeds, we, we didn't know, right? We didn't know what the steady state of the environment would be. So we brought up full e-comm capability at Moscone. Uh, we had a VoIP phone, we had a video feed, we had multiple nodes on the roof and inside of Moscone. Ultimately, we didn't need any of that capability, but it was a relatively good exercise for us. And I'm pretty proud of the fact that we, we put together a strike team that assembled this uh, deployment pretty quickly. And then this one, this was me and Isaac, uh, Isaac Bentley over there, last year up in Angwin, California. Uh, this is a Sprint SACOLT, T-Mobile SACOLT now, um, HughesNet uh, dual feed, dual LMB feed uh, downlink. And then over here, I don't know if you can see, these are the, the Pakchuk um, uh, Helitac uh, uh, buckets the Helitac um, drafting containers. Um, so they were running Helitac operations out of this base. The problem was up in Angwin, um, it's a valley community, all the fiber had been burned out. So they had no communications up there. So what we did was, um, ultimately we didn't use as much mesh as we anticipated, but we were able to establish a link between the air base and the, city, the community college up there, and then down to the Helitac operations center um, down the runway using the equipment we already had on hand. Um, so that was the capability, right? The ability to assemble a strike team and send them up to Angwin um, and get this Helitac base up and running relatively quickly with the equipment that we had on hand, right? It didn't take a lot of knowledge. It was relatively turnkey. Um, so yeah, I was talking about this. This is what we did at Moscone last year. So this is our setup at, uh, an, our initial setup at Moscone. Uh, we, here's Kylie up on the roof. So this is the node we set up up on the roof at Moscone. And then this is at the San Francisco EOC. We just sort of made ourselves some space <laughs> out on the deck. Uh, this is us at the San Francisco Marathon. So this is our portable node. This is the shot we had of one of the choke points. And then we were beaming it uh, back to the operations center here. Uh, this was our DISCA exercise at Fleet Week. There's me. It's me, I promise you. This is a COVID beard. Um, there's me with, uh, with Chief William Scott. And we were beaming back uh, the live feed from the uh, from the uh, staging area. So we're not just doing we're not just doing uh, events and deployments. We're doing some experimentation as well. Um, in August, we did a we worked on a project with the Naval Postgraduate School down at um, Camp Roberts, California National Guard Base, mm -hmm. where we looked at what else can you use a mesh network for. Um, if you look up here on the top right, stage right, you'll see a little RC truck. This is a scale model Hemet truck that's had its RC controllers ripped out. And it's now running a, a Pixhawk, a Raspberry Pi, and I don't know if you recognize this. This is an Arden node right here. So this is a mesh node on five gigahertz connecting to the truck. What we were able to do was run command and control of the truck in real time from a ground control station over the mesh, which in and of itself is a pretty, uh, pretty novel, right? But we were able to not only control the ground vehicle, but extend the mesh as we went, right? So it's now a C3 platform. So what this meant was, imagine me, a, a field responder, a medic, right? I can now have the truck follow me and bring the mesh with it wherever I go. Um, the secondary benefit of that is I can have multiple vehicles chaining to each other, extending the mesh as they go. Another use case was drive this to the top of a hill and park it. Now I have a high site. 
it's relatively inexpensive. Who cares if it goes away, right? So we also looked at it as, well, this could be an ISR payload, a sensor payload. So if you look here, this is a big old LiDAR scanner uh, that we strapped to the top of this truck. So it's still connected to the mesh, but now we can beam the point cloud from this LiDAR scanner back over the mesh to an operations center in real time. And there's just something funny about this photo, but I'll, I'll, leave, I'll leave that to your mind to figure out. But like, here's a bunch of dudes standing around a hole, pointing at the hole. Um, we put the truck with the LiDAR scanner in a tunnel and drove it through the tunnel and did a, a live LiDAR point cloud scan of the tunnel. Um, we were able to extend the mesh into the tunnel by just adding some uh, field deployable mesh nodes throughout the tunnel. Uh, we could just drop them in place. And now we could pilot or uh, give a mission plan to the truck and have it go scan the tunnel in real time and beam it back over the mesh. Um, so this is an example of our setup over here. So we did this um, in collaboration with Cal State University Bakersfield. Uh, the next step of this experiment is to uh, mount this to an airborne platform so we can get aerial extension of the mesh. And then we're working with uh, uh, Naval Special Warfare to enable this on a maritime platform. So think of an autonomous boat that is commanded and controlled over the mesh and then also extending the mesh and then can also carry um, an ISR payload. So this was a fun project to work on. Um, it was certainly hot out there in Paso Robles in August. But, um, these are the kinds of experiments we're running on the mesh. So it's grown a lot. Um, this was the first, I think, picture I published of the net we had built in San Francisco. You know, just a couple nodes here and there. Um, and then within a couple weeks of sort of, you know, tooting my own horn, um, I, we had a lot of other people interested, right? People all over the city. And then, you know, here we are today, right? How it started, how it's going. Um, you know, we have nodes all over the bay. Um, I would say, you know, you can make a voice over IP call on the mesh from Mill Valley to Milpitas without touching the internet. I'm pretty proud of that fact. So, um, the goal is to connect as much of the bay area as possible. Um, there is a, a significant network in the central, central California and southern California. Um, some of the software constraints of Ar the Arden software has got us to sort of decide not to link to those larger networks at this time. So we're really focused on Northern California and the Bay Area. Uh, we have a, uh, we're working on an RF link out to Sacramento. Uh, we're gonna get Elk Grove online, so we get the state EOC connected as well. Um, the next phase of this will be looking at what does a backbone network look like, as opposed to sort of this localized mesh. But you know, we've come a, we've come a long way, baby. Uh, so this is an example of what some of our sites look like. Uh, this is Evans Hall, right? I believe so. This is yeah, UC Berkeley campus. This is one of um, Matheson's node nodes at Berkeley. Uh, I'm not sure where this one's at. I believe this is someone's house, uh, but this is a dish antenna and then a little nano station antenna with just a, a non-penetrating roof mount. Um, these are these are pretty great. These non-penetrating roof mounts. You don't have to to futz with anything on your roof. You just need to carry a couple cinder blocks up. Yeah. Uh, or water buckets, maybe. Uh, this was the node we set up at Moscone. Um, so this is the, pretty sure this is Moscone. Looks like Moscone. It's been so long. It's been a year. Um, so how can you participate in BAM? Um, you can add a node to your QTH or to your work or to somewhere you think might could benefit from this, right? Think of the community organizations, community centers, um, again, showing the utility of what we're doing ultimately gets us buy-in. So if you do something that benefits an organization, they're going to be interested in helping you out. Um, and the equipment's not expensive and it's not that hard to set up, right? So start adding nodes. Um, try to help us find high sites and towers to install nodes, right? That's kind of the biggest challenge right now is there's a lot of interest, but there's nowhere to look, right? Um, so finding places to put nodes, especially high site nodes, right? Towers water tanks, buildings. Um, it, this equipment tends not to interfere or receive too much interference from any commercial equipment. Um, it's relatively low power. It doesn't require shore power, right? So you don't need a contractor to come run wiring for you. Um, collaborate with us. Uh, we have Slack, email. We have uh, Mattermost running on, which is like a Slack, uh, chat system on the mesh. Uh, we have mesh chat. Uh, our website has all of that there. Um, and use it, obviously, right? Uh, the more you use it, the more you're going to become familiar with it, the more you're going to identify the gaps and how to fill those gaps and iterate on what you're doing, right? Tight OTA loop. 
Um, and then we have a booth right out here in the hall uh, where we're showing some other demonstrations. We have uh, some example equipment to show. Uh, so it's booth NP11 right out here in the hallway. Uh, let's get meshy. Uh, I'll take any questions. Yes? So uh, currently, how many of the nine Bay Area counties do you have an activity into? Marin, San Francisco, Mateo, San Mateo, Alameda, Contra Costa, have Matheson. So the question, sorry, the question was how many counties uh, in the Bay Area have we gotten into? Uh, were we missing yeah. anyone? You got Santa Clara. Santa Clara, Santa Clara, Santa Clara, Santa Clara yeah. San Mateo, Solano. Solano, yeah, we're working our way around. Um, again, no, don't think of any isolated node as an island, right? That isolated node is still adding capability. Uh, we have had conversations with uh, EM in Sonoma County. Um, Sacramento is kind of working at their own pace, coming back in this direction. Um, so that's about. How, there's a live map. If you go to our website, uh, there's a live map there, and then we also have a map over there. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, two questions. First off, are you someone that's involved in emer emergency communications now, or what was before you got involved in the medic? Yeah, I'm a medic in San Francisco. Okay. My other question is, I don't see any connections out to the San Ramon, Livermore, Pleasanton area. Yeah. And I'm wondering if there's any reason for that, because it's grown so much. Okay, so the first question was, um, who the hell am I? Um, a little bit about me. Um, so I'm radio operations lead for San Francisco ACS. I'm also president of the San Francisco Radio Club. I'm also a, a field medic supervisor for rock medicine. Um, I've been an EMT for uh, a while. I also have a tactical endorsement, so I've gone out and done uh, tactical training. Um, I'm generally a communications technology specialist. I've been doing, I used to live in South Florida, so I've done hurricane response. I, I don't like tooting my horn all that much, but like, <laughs> I've been doing this for a while. <laughs> um, I'd like to think I'm speaking with some, um, some level of authenticity about the, the gaps that I've seen. So yeah, that hopefully that answers the first question. Yeah, yeah thanks. Yeah, um, and then, uh, yeah, nothing out to Livermore yet. Again, right? It's not for lack of desire. Well, it's like just where we are right now. Right now, yeah, right, yeah. That, that's obviously a challenge, right? San Ramon. Um, no, it's not for lack of desire. Um, you know, a lot of this is word of mouth, right? Going to club meetings, going to Pacificon, talking about the project, and getting folks who are interested to participate. Um, so again, right? Just because an area doesn't appear on here doesn't mean we're like, you know, screw, screw Woodacre. I, no, I don't. I haven't met anyone in Woodacre yet. You know. <laughs> well, I'm sorry to. Yeah, sure. Go ahead. Is is the network accessible from this area now? In I don't words, believe there's any high sites area? that we could hit from here at the moment. Yeah, I don't. Area. I don't think there's any sites here yet. We we work working on Diablo. Yeah. I believe Vaca is going to be coming online. Mount Tam will be coming online. So it's it's slow growing. Yeah, but I don't believe there's any way currently today to walk outside and connect to the network. But that's a good question. You can IP tunnel. Yes. Um, it's not the best way to connect to the network, but you can do an over the internet IP tunnel into the network. Yeah. And I hope I can't, the, the question was, why is there nothing out here yet? And hopefully that answers it. Yeah. Did you have a question over there? No. Oh, okay. Scratch your hand. Anyone else? Any other questions? Well, I appreciate everyone coming. I also, I wanted to say, like, I appreciate everyone having made it through the last 18 months. Like, it was weird. The last 18 months were weird. Like, I'm glad, I'm glad everyone's here. Like, I hope, I hope. Your, your lives are, are somewhat even keeled at this point. Um, I've certainly had a challenging year. Um, it has certainly been at the detriment of this project. We haven't done quite as much build out as we had anticipated doing in the past year. Um, my hope is that going forward, we'll garner some more interest and we'll be able to get out more. You know, I, We haven't wanted to send people out to do installs, right? It's just, how, who knows what it's gonna be like out there. Um, so hopefully going forward, we can continue to build out the network and garner interest. And then everyone, you know, stays safe, and that we sort of emerge from this. But I'm really glad everyone's here. I hope I hope everyone, you know, has uh, a sane remainder of, of 2021 and can make it into 2022. Any other questions? Sweet. All right. Thanks for coming, all.